friends. I trust that you will not be too much misled by this title, What is Man? It refers to woman just as much as to man. So it's really about human nature. Did you know that today, in all thinking circles, the most important subject is the nature of man? It is surprising how many treatises are written on it. We will give you some idea of the nature of man. In the 19th century, the concept of man was rather simple, and also in the beginning of this century. Man is an animal. Now, there were two sciences that contributed to this. One was biology. Man is an animal. It was, of course, man has an ancestry in the animal kingdom. But there were those who went on to say, that's all that he is. It's just an animal. It's just an animal. It's just an animal. It's just an animal. We can be expected to act like beasts because we are beasts. Man is an animal. Then there was another science that helped this, and that was the psychology of the last century, particularly the dogs of Pavlov. It's just an animal. Pavlov worked with a number of dogs, and whenever he fed them, he would ring a bell. After a while, they became so conditioned to eating with the sound of the ringing of the bell that he did not give them food, he rang the bell. What happened? Their mouths began to water. Now this was what Pavlov said was a conditioned reflex. And then it became popular to say, that's all we are, we just stick us with a pin and we jump. And man is nothing more than uh, a behavior machine. Something like an animal. Something like an animal. Now that was the 19th century. In this century, things have changed. We're getting smarter. Man is no longer an animal today, and there are various disciplines which have changed our nature, our concept of man. One of them, for example, is art. art. The more we study art, the more we see that only man can produce it. An animal cannot. We have no record of art in the highest developed animal. You meet art only when you come to man. There was not even a slow evolution. For example, the wild horse was not an impressionist and the racehorse a post-impressionist. The jackal didn't begin to paint badly and man began to paint well. So that the first record that we have of art of any kind is a painting in the cave in France. We say, oh yes, man was there. We recently dug up around Nice some very old tools and bits of pottery, and they apparently belong to a very ancient age. The argument, of course, is man is here. Man is here. They didn't say an animal was here. Incidentally, that is how one would argue the existence of God. You've got a mind producing this universe. Otherwise, we would not have law and order and art in it. So art has done much to convince our modern age about the difference between man and an animal. Then something else in the 20th century that has made us see the difference between man and an animal is science. This earth of ours is very small. The universe seems to be very, very big. It's even expanding. But man is not an insignificant cockroach. And why? Simply because man is able to get the whole heavens into his head. The whole heavens into his head. Therefore, he's bigger than the universe. You can understand it. That is the glory of, of science. No scientist is ever in the machine that he explains. For example, the scientist who designed that particular camera, too, that's looking at me now, he's not in it. If he were in it, he, too, would need an explanation. 
Man is bigger than the universe because he can get the heavens into his head, which means that he's only got one job left, to get his head into the heavens. Get his head into the heavens. Something else that proves that man is different from an animal is the fact of life. The fact of life. You never have any laughter in creation until you get to Until you get to That was why the scholastic philosophers were so fond of describing man after the Greek Aristotle as homo resemblance. Man is, is a laughing animal. A hyena has its mouth open, but a hyena doesn't laugh. Now, why is it that only man can laugh? What's the reason? You have to understand what laughter is, and the definition of laughter is not funny. Really. Laughter is the unexpected juxtaposition of two ideas. Not a bit funny, is it? Perhaps I could explain it by, by a pun. A little girl was asked by the neighbor next door, what are you going to do when you get as big as your mother? She said, diet. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Very good. Here, there were two ideas. The word big had two different concepts or definitions. One was size, physical size, and the other was age. If you have a box that's filled with salt, you can't fill it with pepper. It's only something spiritual in the mind that's able to hold together two ideas like this with two different meanings. Two different meanings. A parrot, for example, would hear the language any animal would, but it wouldn't laugh. Why? Because it cannot get meaning. And what is precisely interesting, it cannot get different meaning out of words. And therefore, this gift of, uh, of laughter uh, is really a proof that we are, despite the sadness of this veil of tears, this gift of laughter is one of the proofs that we are very, very different from the animal. And there's something mysterious in us, whatever it happens to be. To be. Now there's one other argument that can be given, particularly typical of the 20th century. It is sense of shame. Shame. Uh, what is the sense of shame? A fear of exposure for something that we have done wrong. Let no one make fun of the depth of theology and philosophy there is in the book of Genesis. After man abused his gift of freedom, he hid. And the divine voice said to him, why did you hide? Why did you hide? It said, I was naked and I was ashamed. There was a fear of exposure. What's the making of fig leaves? <laughs> Things that can't cover up our shame. So today, Modern man proves that he's very different from an animal by the fact that he is always trying to cover up something. He, he fears exposure before others, before the public, whether he knows it or not, before God. So he wears a mask. He's one man in public, another man may be at home. And this sense of shame, too, is evident, for example, in the desire to have publicity. Why publicity? Why the fondness of publicity today? To create a new image. We're very fond of that word. No, we have not the right image for this man. Now we get public relations men. Spend $150,000. We change his image. Why? Because we're ashamed of the image. These are fig leaves. What is it that produces this shame? It's the dread of light. Because light exposes us. Now we say a man is afraid of his shadow and exposure. Why is there a shadow that follows us in our lives? Well, there's a light, light of conscience. The light of the tradition of the human race and the light that illumined every man coming into the world. The light that comes from God. Now most men they're afraid of this light, so they turn their back to it. You think a bank robber who's just about to open a safe wants a policeman searchlight shining on him? That would expose his crime. 
So we're running away from the light. What happens? When the sun is behind you, what do you look like? And so men are going along. Ooh, shadow. Oh, oh, and it gets longer and longer and longer the more they walk away from the light. And they try to cover it up, to hide their shame. That's not the answer. Shame is really uh, an indication and a sign of human dignity and worth. And until that light shines on us, we really never see ourselves. So there are various kinds of ways in which God's light shines upon conscience. Help destroy, destroy this mask and shadow of life. And there's a way out, and we are not to be ashamed of shame, because there's one simple law to follow. If you keep the light before you, the shadows will always fall behind you, and you need never fear. You walk in the light of God. Bishop Sheen will return in a moment.